to get some order in the room here to make sure everybody's well behaved. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm very excited to see such a great crowd in July. Uh, we could turn the air conditioner down a little if you need it, but we don't want to stress the building out. We're trying to, we're trying to keep it standing at least for another couple of years. Um, do we have any new faces here tonight? Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. We're happy to have you. Um, we are, um, we've got a couple of housekeeping notices that I just wanted to give you uh, before we get started. One, I would like to let you all know we have a blood drive next Saturday, and hate to ask you, normally people ask you this, this 16th, yes, this coming Saturday. Um, and we normally ask you for money, not blood, but we would like both, actually. Um, uh, this is for a, a, just a great gentleman who was very helpful to us for many years, um, Steve Stewart, who has uh, got some pretty serious medical issues, and so if you're in the neighborhood on Saturday, and would like to come by, we'd love that. There's some forms by the door that you can pick up that tell you how to register, um, and uh, we would really appreciate it. Also wanted to let you know we have a program going on this summer, started in June and all through July, Saturdays, uh, and they're called Family Days, and we have different programs every Saturday from 12 to 5 where you can bring, it's children's activities that we do, and a lot of them, are, they're just a lot of fun. I think, I don't know if we have one of our little boats around, but. Um, what happens is by the end of the day we all have the staff is all sitting around making all these crafts and things like that with the kids but they're really neat so if you know anyone or would like to bring some children bring children 5 to 12 here's a flyer take it and drop it off and if you have kids in your neighborhood just go hand them out and get them to come to the museum um, before I introduce our uh, speaker tonight, I wanted to let you know we've got our next month's lecture, there's also a flyer about that, is about the uh, Ernest Shackleton's voyage to Antarctica. Um, and so that should be very interesting and appropriate for August, because they will be talking about something to cool you off. Um, I think if we've got some more room in the room over here, if there's some people in the back that want to go sit down. Um, this is very exciting. We've had, uh, this is a little bit different topic and one of the things that's so exciting about the museum is that we have the opportunity to talk about a lot of different things and it's all related to the maritime world. One way or the other, it all connects and that's why we're here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Stephen Curley. Um, he is a Regents Professor and uh, awarding winning teacher of literature, film and uh, writing at Texas A&M University of Galveston. And he is going to uh, offer really unique presentations tonight that we're very excited about, and it's about the voyage of life, and he's going to show that to us through various mediums. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Curley. I looked at the title and I noticed I understood all the words except one uh, metaphor. I just, I just came back from a family trip with, and I, I saw my grandchildren. And one, one of the things that grandchildren do is tell you how much they love you, which is a really good thing. Uh, I asked my, my granddaughter, Grace, and she, she said, she said, pop, pop, pop. My, some people think my name is Dr. Curley, but really it's Pop Pop. He said, uh, Pop Pop, I love you this much. As, as if love was a quantity that you could measure between outstretched palms. And of course it is in some real sense. I understand if, if she had said, Pop Pop, I love you this much. No. <laughs> now, the difference between uh, two inches and six feet isn't really that great, but there's something in the effort required to stretch out that creates the meaning for something as qualitative as love. And that's, that's what a metaphor is, is all about, it's comparison. Saying one thing that's known to convey something that perhaps isn't as known. Uh, and that's, that's where we find ourselves with, with this. I'm going to deal with it in, in three different ways. I, I teach a course called Literature of the Sea. And uh, we'll do a little Conrad, a little Melville, and, and other things as well every semester. Uh, among the things that, that, I, that I do is talk about 
not only literature, but also art and music, which in some sense are, are a kind of literature. And I'm, I'm thinking about the metaphor of life as a voyage. Life is like a voyage. Life is like a sea voyage, in particular. And, then, and that resonates for, uh, when you think about how important the sea has been in history and culture. Not only how important, but also how ornery and how unknown and how life-threateningly dangerous it is, which is pretty much the same thing we can say about life. Um, that's, that's, that's where we find ourselves. And, and we're going to start off with uh, poetry. Uh, this is Walt Whitman, uh, who invented more than the Whitman sampler. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leaves of Grass was published in 1855. Now, Whitman is a poet who essentially rescued poetry from the chains of rhyme and meter. Uh, and now, not that I, I don't like rhyme and meter. Uh, if you like Shakespeare, if you, you love meter. If, if you like Emily Dickinson, you love rhyme. Uh, but you can write poetry in other ways, and he worked on those other ways. In fact, he worked all his life on that particular book, Leaves of Grass. Uh, Maddingly, he revised it about every six years. Uh, some people say that that uh, uh, John, uh, that Lucas, uh, uh, the, the direct, George Lucas, the director of Star Wars, has a Whitman complex. If you've ever tried to see the 1977 version of Star Wars, good luck. <laughs> He's, he has revised it, and the, the, the current new and improved version has about 300 different changes in it. Uh, but if you're the author, I guess you can do what you want. Uh, Whitman tinkered with leaves of grass, is, uh, and Whitman is known for uh, a kind for being a romantic realist. And it sounds like a contradiction, but we'll take a look and see how that works. Aboard at a ship's helm, a young steersman steering with care through fog and a seacoast dolefully ringing. An ocean bell, oh, a warning bell, rocked by the waves. Oh, you give good notice indeed, you bell by the sea reefs ringing, 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 to warn the ship from its wrecked place. For as on the alert of steersman you mind the loud admonition, the bows turn the freighted ship tacking speeds away under her gray sails. The beautiful and noble ship with all her precious wealth speeds away gaily and safe. But oh, the ship, the immortal ship. Oh, ship aboard the ship, ship of the body, ship of the soul. Voyaging, voyaging, voyaging. Now, first of all, you know it's poetry because it, uh, the lines don't go to the end of the page, which is a good way. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's almost a tried and true way. Even if it doesn't rhyme, and even if it doesn't have meter, and me meter is, is like, you know, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Let me not to the marriage through my admitted impediments. Uh, they aboard it at a ship's helm. Aboard of the ship's helm is a much shorter line than a, a young student steering with care. Uh, but you, you get, there's a, there's a sense, first of all, all those ING words, those participles, are, are part of the, of the, the process itself. Uh, steering, ringing, warning, voyaging, and sometimes we even get to, to repeat it, voyaging, 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 which is a lot of fun if you're an actor, you, you can play, once you get, I think, think about Martin Luther King when, when he had, had a dream, when he used that line the first time, it was a pretty good line. And then he used it again. And if you listen carefully, you can tell that he changed his voice a bit. And by the time he got to the third use, he, he had everybody in the palm of his hands. And they were all listening for the punctuation of I have a dream. Uh, when you, you can say, voyaging, voyaging, voyaging. Or you can go the other way, voyaging, voyaging. You play with the words, make them work for you. A lot of open vowels, too. Uh, you, you learned the ABCs. Remember that there are vowels and consonants. Do you know the difference between a vowel and a consonant? Really? It has to do with, uh, we're all wind instruments. Uh, and some of us, after reading, get to be, well, never mind. But we're all wind instruments. And what happens when we say, I, oh, those are all vowels because they're open and unconstricted. 
Once you constrict them, you turn them into consonants. P, T, Z, S. And uh, what, what I've done to the air is, is constricted it now. If you're a singer or if you're a poet, you're looking for the assonance of those rich, round, open vowels. Uh, ocean, O, a warning bell, rock by the wave. You can hold that for a long time. You can rock by the wave. The open vowels are part of what's, what this song is about. All right, so what do we have? Literally, we have to understand the poem. We've, we've got this, this, this kid who's a steersman, and he's steering with care, which is all, everything you want to be uh, if you have a, a ship. Uh, the ship needs to have someone who is, who is looking and listening. Uh, there's, there's a warning bell ringing, ringing, ringing to warn the ship from its wreck place. Now, the kid is good. He's, he is listening. And because he, he listens, he heeds or minds the loud admonition. And, and by the way, you know, what we're talking about here, in, this is the, the romantic part is all the, the allegorical stuff and the metaphorical stuff behind it, that sense of nature. The realistic part is, oh, he's really talking about ships, and not just any ships. He's a freighted ship. This merchant marine. Uh, uh, Walt Whitman lived in Brooklyn. And uh, the port of New York is, is at his doorstep. He would walk down to the port and see it, uh, and and see the ships lined up on both sides of, of the East River and the Hudson River. They, that was part of his, his daily life. He understood that, and and the the story is essentially that you, there's a, there's a wrecked place. The the warning bell of the sea buoy rings, and what you do is you steer around it. And that's what you should do. That's good enough. But probably, if you were listening to it, you said, "Oh, I, some, there's something more there." Uh, of course, I'm an English teacher. There's always something more. Uh, there's something more behind it. And that the last part is, in some sense, a giveaway. But you don't really need it. You probably could have guessed that without it. Uh, well, you know, I know what ships are, and that. Uh, I came in wearing my uh, Texas Clipper hat. Uh, that was a really old ship when when she was she was scuttled and reefed down in Port, Port Isabel. Uh, really old means in ship terms uh, finitely young, I mean, but ships disappear. That's they get old. They, you can't keep them afloat anymore. They 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 rust out from underneath you. Uh, there's no such thing as an immortal ship. Ah, uh, but there is. Remember how much uh, Pop Up got loved? Uh, there is an immortal ship, ship aboard the ship. And by the way, those of you who think, hey, that's the one of the definitions of a ship is it, you, know, you can put a boat in the ship, but you can't put a ship on anything. Uh, well, there, is there a ship aboard a ship? Ship of the body, ship of the soul. And then, ah, yeah, I got, I got exactly where, where he's going with this. The whole idea is that you and I are on a voyage. And there are wreck places. It's called life. Anybody here without scars? Uh, it's called life. All the wreck places there. But you're all survivors. Anybody here not alive yet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can hold hands and try to come back to living if we want to. Uh, the, the, the sense of being alive, of being a survivor, of being essentially where we are on a voyage from point A to point B, uh, from, uh, from womb to tomb. Or in a more, uh, if you think of it more in terms of innocence and experience, that's where we're headed. Romanticism, which was uh, really big in, in England, where America gets most of its uh, poetic culture in the 19th century, uh, romanticism was alive and well from the 1790s up through maybe the 1820s when all, all the, uh, the early romantic poets died. But then it, it came to America and got called, tweaked a little bit, got called transcendentalism. And the sense of what we're seeing here, this nature spelled with a capital N, uh, what um, Neuropolo and Weberson called the transparent eyeball, that ex essentially the way you look, the way you live is to get as close to nature as possible, and that's what you learn. The way you learn is by experience, the way you learn is by minding the, 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 that freighted ship by listening to the wreck places, by being a, 
by being a good Jimmy Cricket to to Pinocchio and make sure they get him out of trouble. Or the the good, uh, the, the kind of angel. When the, and those Warner Brothers cartoons would have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the on the other shoulder. Well, what we've got in this young steersman is that angel, that angelic voice saying, yes, this is really good and you can make it. And the freighted ship can make it through. Freighted, as we all are, ship of the body, ship of the soul, voyaging, voyaging, voyaging. Right, pretty simple. Uh, and, uh, nonetheless, rather delightful. It's playful. Uh, we play with words, we play with sounds, we play with ideas, and we're playing with the story of what it is that ships are about, and how you and I are all ships. Well, let me use another word, vessel, and which I'm sure sounds pretty spiritual to a number of you, <laughs> thinking about, you know, that preacher always says that, you know, we're vessels, we do this, uh, I mean, vessels carry, uh, vessels hold, and what we hold is that life, ship of the body, ship of the soul. Right. Thomas Cole, uh, 1801, 1848, he died really young, uh, uh, Four women lived a long time. Cole was born in Britain. Uh, he, he, the em family emigrated when he was when he was a child. Uh, he went back to Europe a couple of uh, times. Self-taught artist. He worked as an itinerant portrait painter. Again, if you got a little talent, you go around and try to make some money. He didn't make much money that way uh, until he was kind of discovered by somebody who was serious enough and, and got into the Philadelphia set and, and uh, work with Philadelphia artists and exhibited with them. And he, he's the founder of what today is known as the Hudson River School. Realistic landscapes full of romantic sublimity uh, and naturalism. Uh, he uh, painted so we're going to look at a, a kind of a narrative art. This is a kind of interesting. We're, we're looking at a series of four paintings. Uh, there is, Course of the Empire is one of his, his narrative series, and the other one, uh, probably more famous, is The Voyage of Life. He painted it on commission, uh, and the person, unfortunately, died before the commission was finished. Uh, his heirs took it, and they kind of didn't have the same taste as the old man, but they kept on, they held on to it anyway. Cole asked for it so he could show it off, which is, before PowerPoint, there was real life. Some of you were old enough to <laughs> real life. <laughs> Don't look it up on Google. <laughs> but real life means that if you're an artist, the only way you can actually show people what you can do is to exhibit your paintings. And even though you may have done it on commission and somebody else bought it from you, uh, that person might, and especially it's going to, going to increase the value of your painting if it goes into an exhibit, and that's the way it would happen. But the, uh, the family decided, no, they didn't want to, to play that game. He was in Europe on a second trip in Italy, and uh, people said they had heard about this. Uh, he had made tracings of it, and that he had cartoons, which are you know, small, small versions of these, these panels, which are about the size of a piece of plywood, about, about four by eight. Um, and so he painted a second set, which are, is alike in the, the major conceptions, but he considered it an improvement. And that's the one that uh, I'm using, partly because it's the one that's more widely available. First set is up in Utica, Utica New York. The second set used to be in Bethesda Hospital in Ohio. Uh, he, he, he settled in Ohio for a while, and that was in, in, those, in the early days of the 19th century. That was, that was about as far west as any decent human being wanted to go, <laughs> uh, long before Texas, but uh, for most of us. The, he he said he settled there, and uh, the, the paintings uh, the paintings were in were exhibited in a chapel within the hospital, and then they were discovered by the Cincinnati uh, Register, uh, and they and when the Cincinnati Register discovered these paintings, they. There's a brouhaha about oh, you have to put them under lock and key. They're, they need to have need to be under air conditioned supervision. And so what they what they did was sell it to the National Gallery. The National Gallery bought it and they, they, they had copies made of it and still go see the copies there. But the the originals are in the American wing and they're in an octagonal room that's really not a room but 
a way of going between places. So, you know, in this in this building, there are little cubby holes and there are ways to go in and out. That's where he, he hung it. Where are you going to put four four by eight paintings? Uh, most of us don't have a wall that big, and that's 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 what he did. When he died, uh, six weeks after his death, there was a retrospective, and the equivalent of one half of the population of New York City went to see his exhibit. And, and that's pretty impressive. What's impressive in the other way is that soon after that, in the 1860s with the Civil War, interest in Thomas Cole died, and uh, we didn't, we found him old-fashioned, a little too preachy, too sentimental, until his, until the uh, 1948, which was the, uh, the centennial of his death, uh, he really had disappeared from view, and then he came back, and this is what, what we have. This, these paintings. First one is called Childhood. Now it's about six foot wide, so it's, uh, it's bigger than you see it here. Uh, usually, when I ask my class to, to talk about what, what they can see there, I'm not sure how the, it's some of you in the back probably can't see it all that well, but understand what what first of all it's childhood and what we have is a, a child in a boat coming out of this deep, dark cavern. And uh, let me use a metaphorical term, term for that that has to deal with birth. Cavern, yeah, womb. Yeah. Right. Coming out of the womb of the earth, uh, and there are flowery banks and rosy light. Uh, it's the, the, at the time of day, well, you, you can see that. Wow. It's dawn, this is dawn. Uh, the, the time of year, spring, spring. Oh, beginning yeah. of the year, beginning of dawn, beginning of the day. Uh, this is a, a detail, I'm sure. Okay. We're looking at the detail and we've got a laughing in, infant and uh, the, the figurehead is holding up an hourglass. And of course all the sand is up at the top. And the figurehead is, is an angel, angelic figure too. Uh, there are Egyptian lotus blossoms uh, strewn uh, on the, in, the, in the foreground. And what, now you couldn't figure this out, and I couldn't figure it out, but uh, Cole was a frustrated preacher and a frustrated poet. He couldn't really write poetry that well. He wasn't all that good with figures, uh, but he, so he, he said that the, that the Egyptian lotus symbolizes human life, and I guess take that. That's, that's what it symbolizes, now you know. Uh, also, those, the figures on the side of the, uh, the boat, they're, they're very interesting figures, but they are the figures of the hours, H-O-U-R-S, another version of time. And once again, you knew and I couldn't know that unless he, he, he told us, but it's, it's close enough. The, the banks that, the, that they're issuing from are very narrow, as the experience of childhood is narrow. Everything about this is portentous. Everything about this is a voyage. It is the beginning of the voyage. The voyage is on a landscape, and it's on a river in a vessel. And now some, some of you, I heard you mention, said, oh, it's an angel. Uh, you, you can see it with, with the nimbus around the, around, the, around the head of the angel, and the, and the wings, and the beautiful uh, gown that the, the angel is wearing. Uh, the angel's right hand, It's on the tiller, essentially. Steering, right. Steer, right. This, uh, the idea is right. Of course, the the, the child, who is absolutely delighted, this laughing infant, is full of joy, uh, and is unaware of the angel who is behind the child anyway. Uh, and the, it's in this verdant, uh, uh, flower strewn boat, everything is happy, things are things are looking good. Everybody, you're, you're ready to follow me so far? This is really great. Let's, all right, it's you. Things are still looking good. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you also the detail for that, but let's look at the whole picture first. Uh, what we can see, it, let, let's go about um, the time of day. Midday. midday. Yeah, it's midday. You can see the lights. Midday. Time of year? Summer. Summer, although if it were used and everything would be brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the Hudson River, it's summer. 
<laughs> the the and the what if you well when we get close to the Uh, the the hourglass, some of the sand is down at the bottom. Some of the time has passed. Uh, the hourglass is actually held up further. Every every one, the the figurehead, the youth. The, um, by the way, the most effective change of clothes for him. That's the only way I can figure. Uh, having this red tunic and the angel, they're all gesturing in exactly the same direction. Forward. Uh, forward to you can see where the river goes. It goes uh, to the left. And uh, by the way, we've, we've reversed the, the direction in here. Uh, understand that if you go and see these paintings, you'll see them on opposite walls. And so the direction is kind of mixed up because you can't put them all together and, and show a linear progression from left to right. Uh, so they, we, we alternate from right to left, left to right, left to left, left to right. Uh, the, the river is headed directly for, what the heck is that up in the upper left hand side? Hey, here it is. It looks the Galveston looks like Sacred Heart Church. But there I have made this a Taj Mahal. It's essentially a castle in the sky made out of clouds. And that's where we're headed. You remember this when you were youth? That was where we were headed. We're all there. I remember my first I was going to be a cowboy, then I thought I would be an astronaut, but uh, ended up an English teacher, which is by far higher. <laughs> but they, on our campus, we, we often have uh, people, people who come uh, to tour the campus early, uh, teenagers from, uh, from high school and middle school. And when, when they're touring campus, you really have to watch out. They'll run into you. Not because they're doing it on purpose, but because they're just avoiding. They're full of life. They can't help it. Everything is wonderful, and they're and so you, you, you just have to watch where they're going. And this they're kid, yeah, <laughs> this kid knows exactly where he's going. Notice the, the angel is saying Godspeed, but the kid's not even looking at the angel. <laughs> he's, experience has not taught him what is the real yet. Now, now, by the way, I don't, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm in, not in favor of, of unreality. Uh, the Browning said a man's reach should exceed his grasp of what's ahead and for. Uh, so I'm, you might want to keep that in mind a, a little bit later. But the, it's idealism. It's looking for that particular ideal that's out there, and the youth knows exactly where he's headed. Now, those of you who are sharper-eyed than the youth and are looking to the right-hand side may notice through the trees, you, you see that the stream didn't exactly go straight up that mountain where the path seems to be going. Uh, the stream backs around, and uh, it looks kind of rough. Uh, in, the, in the background, yeah, as you can see, as we get, get to the end. Now, I, you know, that's... Time gets flattened out if you can see it. So, sometimes people would, would say, you know, how, to, how exactly is it possible that uh, there could be divine foreknowledge? And they say, well, you know, time is like a river. And if you get high enough, you know exactly where the river's going. If you're on a raft in the middle of the river with, uh, with Tom and Jim, you don't know where the river's going. You just, you're floating <laughs> along. You're going along with the current. Uh, that's, that's where you and I are right now, where we're, we're in a raft. Some of you have your hand in the tiller, and uh, as the boy has, now he's in charge, he's steering, uh, and is, uh, but does not have uh, the, the same glimpse of the nasty screen that we have. Any, any uh, other things you want to say about it? All right. All right. Now we go to manhood. <laughs> Middle age. Despair. <laughs> yeah. This is the 10 o'clock news. Breaking news. <laughs> Everybody's running for president. Uh, <laughs> the dark clouds of middle age are up at the top. Now, if you look toward the middle up, you can see what's kind of like gray clouds. These are demon forms that, that Cole has, has uh, identified for us as suicide, intemperance, and murder. Uh, they are temptations that beset us in our middle years in direst trouble. The things that we turn to. In other words, it's despair. 
all of those things up there. Uh, it, it's hard. It, 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 you may be able to see right dead center. There's a face. Mm -hmm. We go back up to the clouds again above that that cup, the chalice over there. And if you go further to the left, uh, the, the we take a look. Oh, well, yeah. those uh, the the hours, the, the expression has changed. They look like Mr. Bill. Ooh. <laughs> it, it's, time has worn them down too. There's more sand at the bottom of the glass. Uh, the time of the year. Uh, yeah, fall. Well, you can see the, the, the kind of dead and dying leaves. We're now in autumn. We've, we've, we've taken the seasonal cycle. Also, in, in, in terms of the diurnal, the day cycle, we are now at, well, at twilight. So the sunset, uh, the sun is setting over that distant uh, ocean in the past. And uh, there, there's that, that cataract. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Two responses. Uh, one is oh shit, and the other, and the other is what the is what the man does. He's <laughs> now why doesn't he have his hand on the tiller? He's praying. Oh, yeah. It's gone. The tiller is gone. There is no tiller. You have no control. That was an illusion too. I mean, now you, some of you were smart enough to know that the clouds were illusion. What you weren't smart enough to know like I wasn't smart enough to know is that the tiller is an illusion as well. The idea that you are really in charge of your destiny is a big fat lie. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, he, so what he's, what he's doing is he's looking upwards and saying, I, and the, the Cole, who by the way got religion in his 30s, he, he, he had been fairly unreligious and then he uh, turned Anglican and, and, and so Part of the reason that I think people look at this and, and they see a kind of a, a preachiness in, in, in what's what's going on. He hasn't given up everything though. If you look inside the boat, some of the the stuff that's uh, is still there. Some of the riches, some of the wealth. You know, they always said that uh, you never see a uh, a U-Haul come going up to the graveyard, but uh, he's got one uh, with a little bit of stuff. Most of it has fallen out. There there's some floating. Uh, there's a floating cup in the in the water. The uh, the hourglass time is just about run out. He's uh, he is he has has the beard. That's so we can see that he's older. Uh, we understand that 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 he believes and he shows a dependence on a superior being, which according to the way that Thomas Cole reads it, that faith saves you. Now you probably knew as you came into this that this was going to be a comedy, not comedy in the sense of divine comedy. You know, the, the idea, it's, if it ends with something like uh, death, or it ends with, uh, the, the, uh, with hell, or it ends with the crucifixion, that's tragedy. Uh, divine comedy ends with, with salvation, with redemption. Uh, <coughs> comedy, when Shakespeare wrote comedies, he ended with marriage. Uh, which is a way of ensuring the continuance of the human race uh, by love and also by fruition. Uh, so it's, it's an absurd faith that it's going to continue and everything is hunky-dory regardless of what, what happened in Hamlet's universe. The, uh, you, where you end it depends on, on this. But you could have told right from the beginning, because, look, why did they draw that angel otherwise? And it, it, if we look at those angels, there's the angels all the way, once again, in the back, in the background. Uh, the, our figure, us, child, youth, adult, uh, has never actually looked at the angel, has never seen that particular guidance. Right, let, me, let me use a word for that, a good Anglican word, like providence. Uh, this is a providential series of, of paintings. The whirlwind right, is, is rising, but what we're going to find out is that it's going to be okay. Uh, we get, you look close uh, at this hourglass, it's gone. The figurehead is gone, the hourglass is gone. There is no more time. Time is over. Uh, the, the day is over. We're in this kind of midnight, the dark clouds, although what's happening in the upper left-hand corner is, is uh, an amazing little kind of stair step of these angelic creatures kind of welcoming him in. At the, this is the first time when the angel was actually in the front guiding. Uh, the, the, 
in old age, what we have is someone who is no longer interested in the mortal life, but is interested in the immortal, and has a glimpse of that through the angel, uh, a glimpse of what's what's out there. Uh, the world is with us late and soon. A glimpse of immortality. The guardian, uh, the guardian spirit, is now revealed, beaming with joy, and and putting him on. We didn't expect to see the man's bleached bones and at the end of, the, of the, in the mouth of the river. What we get is no worldly accumulations, but a, a sense of, it all worked out. Hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are cynical. All right. <laughs> uh, the British ballads of Francis Anne Shallow, by the way, was the first English professor at Harvard University, published a book, boy, what a book, it came out in 10 parts from 1882 to 1894, of British ballads, of uh, the English and Scottish popular ballads that were, that were a lot of them were popular, and some in the Appalachians. Uh, I mean, we had a, a tremendous uh, diaspora, uh, and the, that became native to the population there. The earliest known version of the song that I'm going to look at, uh, The Golden Vanity, uh, is, is called the, uh, the Sweet Trinity, and it's about, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh gets in there, but uh, he's not like the Sir Walter Raleigh, he puts down his cape over the puddle and says, walk on it, he's a son of a bitch. And, and uh, that's kind of like the captain of, of the ship. This is generally not considered a shanty, more, uh, but you can use any, any song for a work song at sea. Stan Ugal said that he sang it as a pumpkin capstan shanty. ship and she put out to sea and the name of that ship was the golden vanity she sailed upon the low and the lonesome low she sailed upon that lonesome sea she had not been out but two weeks or three when she was overtaken by a Turkish rebel pirate ship. As she sailed upon the low and lonesome low, as she sailed upon that lonesome sea, then up spake our little cabin boy, saying, what will you give me if I will then destroy? If I sink them in the low and lonesome low, if I sink them in that lonesome sea. Oh, the man that them destroys, our captain then replied, five thousand pounds and my daughter for his bride. If he sinks him in the low and lonesome low, if he sinks him in that lonesome sea, then the boy smote his breast and down jumped he, he swum till he come to that Turkish reveille. As she sail upon the low and lonesome low, as she sailed upon that lonesome sea, he had a little tool that was made for the use. He made nine holes in her hull. And he sunk her in the low and the lonesome low. He sunk her in the lonesome sea. Then he swung back to his ship and he beat upon the side, saying, Captain, pick me up for I'm weary with the tide. I'm sinking in the low and lonesome low. 
I'm sinking in that lonesome sea. Oh, I will not pick you up, the captain then replied, I will shoot you, I will drown you, I will sink you in the tide. I will sink you in that low and lonesome low. I will sink you in that lonesome sea. If it was not for the love that I bear unto your men, I would do unto you as I did unto them. I would sink you in the low and lonesome low. I would sink you in that lonesome sea. Then the bow bowed his head and down sunk he. Farewell, farewell. As she sailed upon the low and lonesome low, as she sailed upon that lonesome sea, as she sailed upon the low and the lonesome low, sailed upon that lonesome sea. The sea. The, sea. the sea is the sea is building. The sea is, is, is taking taking and, and destroying. Them. Um, the captain's really really a big bad guy. But uh, <laughs> let, let me use uh, as an English teacher kind of uh, deconstruct this a bit and show you where the boy went wrong. When Lois Lane is falling off a building, the supermen say, Lois, if I catch you, will you give me a big sloppy kiss at the end? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What? Now, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not against capitalism here, but uh, <laughs> oh, what has the boy essentially, and, th and this is the stuff of fairy tales too, what has the, the boy essentially offered? Yeah, a quick pro quo. You know, I'm going to do something for you. And you will do something for me. What's going to happen to your ship if I don't do anything? Yeah. You're going to be captured. What's going to happen to your freight? The gold. Oh, by the way, listen to the name, Golden Vanity. You can think. Uh, start thinking about the freighted, the freighted ship and, and witness home, and the and the and the golden uh, material wealth in in the voyage of life and Thomas Cole's portraits. Oh, what? What we've got is essentially a deal. Uh, and the captain said, well, what will you give me? And uh, the captain says, I'll tell you what I'll give you. 5,000 pounds and my daughter for his bride. Uh, what do you got to lose? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what the bride looks like. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> now, now you're really deconstructing this moment like that. But even further than I'm going to go. But in, in some sense, what the boy does, imagine the boy says, Captain, can I go destroy the, the, the pirate ship? And the captain says, sure. And he destroys the pirate ship, and then he knocks on the side of the ship. What does the captain do? He picks him up. I mean, a boy with a tool like that, he can be used over and over again. Uh, but he doesn't. Now, in some sense, and, and by the way, there are different versions of this poem. In some, the, the, the sailors commit mutiny and they bring them on board. In others, the sailors uh, uh, explicitly go inside with the captain. Uh, but, you know, what the boy does is self-sacrifice. He really could if he, if he had vengeance in mind. And if Shakespeare had written this as a play, probably he would have. <laughs> he could have drill, drilled the holes in the hull and everybody would have gone down, not just him, which is a, a kind of a good thing to do. But that's not what happens. Uh, what happens is that the, the, the ship sails away daily and safe, just like in Whitman, with minus one cabin board. 
who, by the way, is inconsequential. It's just a cabin boy. Nothing. Now, this, this, when I, when I, I was in the Army, I, did, I got to, to live off this in Fort McClellan, Alabama. And I, I, I was allowed to live off post if I had a phone, but I, I couldn't afford a telephone. So I found a landlady who would let me tap into her line, and I, I was her, she was on one side of, the, the, uh, of our duplex, and I was on the other side. We shared a wall, and we're just newly married. My wife stayed at home, and I was in the Army all day. Uh, at 1 o'clock, she would call up her sister, and you could hear her. You didn't have to listen in on the phone. You could hear her talk about all her relatives. And there were relatives who were in, uh, arrested for murder. There were relatives that, that had amnesia. There were relatives that had given uh, birth out of wedlock several times. I mean, her life was just amazing. Until we discovered what she was doing was watching a soap opera. And as soon as she finished watching the soap opera, she would call her sister up across town and they would discuss it. <laughs> as if these people were real. As if these people were real. Understand that now this is long before uh, streaming videos and DVDs and VHSs and television and radio uh, and, and, and even books in, the, in this, uh, this culture. We, we've got a heck of a story. And it's a story that's worth considering. Now, I'm not sure which side you're going to come out on, and I don't know exactly what the moral of the story is going to be. It's not nearly as simple or as providential as the story that's, that, that's told in Thomas Cole's paintings. Uh, this is a much more complex story about life, and life as it's lived, and the kind of choices we have, uh, bad choices, lessers of two evils, or who knows? I mean, everything, it's all mixed up, and it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. But there's no angel that comes down here and, and takes the boy off to paradise. Well, we don't, there's no, that's, that's not a stanza in this particular, uh, in this particular version of the, of the story. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no sense that the captain is going to be hauled before a maritime court and, and uh, convicted of murder. Uh, there is no, there's, we don't, by the way, we don't really reap at all for those, those rotten pirates who go like that. Who cares about them? <laughs> Not in my conscience. No. Uh, we're concerned mostly about the, the golden vanity, about vanity of vanity, all this vanity. That's what, what really makes us care. Uh, what will you give me if I will then destroy it? There's lots to talk about in the story. It's a way to think about life. And, and when you deal with stories like this, stories like, like Moby Dick, which uh, don't make a whole lot of happy sense, uh, they, but they make a lot of sense in some other sorts of ways. When you're dealing with stories like that, you're grappling with the meaning, you're grappling with what they could mean, and you're grappling with this, your own sense of life. Uh, that's what I think Hold the voyage on. of life is really about. Uh, it's, now, sometimes it all works out well, but e even when it worked out well, it didn't work out well in material ways that you and I wanted. Uh, the, 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 the old man suffered. Uh, now, you might say that's unimportant, but in the, you know, the old man suffered before the angel moved him off. He, he had to navigate that. Uh, we all got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, or, or to put it in another way, we're all in a dinghy somewhere without a rudder. <laughs> we are all a castaway making love to a volleyball. The, uh, what we're trying to figure out is what the meaning of life is for us. Uh, and the meaning of life, in many ways, is what we make it. And how we do that and how we discuss it, uh, and that's what the voyage of life is about. Thank you. Wow. Obviously, some of you didn't understand how unhappy this presentation was. <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions or, or comments? Yes. What did Cole die of? Uh, Pleurisy. Uh, he, he was in the Casco Mountains. Uh, and it, it moved, and those of you who know, the Hudson, the Hudson River School. There's the Palisade. Beautiful cliffs. 
and the, the, the water that goes up to West Point, it, it's, it's just a gorgeous place. He painted it over and over again, and lots of people went out there. That was kind of the, the West before we discovered the national parks. Uh, that's, and the Hudson River School was that sense of the, the grandeur of God is, is in that world. He lived in the Catskills, and uh, it was, I mean, he just took sick and died, and that's, that's, that's what it, it, the diagnosis was. Yes? Uh, those particular paintings of coal, I mean, are they worth much money? And much money. Uh, I think it, the, well, that museum, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The, if you, well, I, I don't know how much the National Gallery paid. They probably paid a pretty good uh, price, and and they did take them, and they they are well cared for now. And I think they they uh, they allowed copies to be to be put in, in the hospital. But if you brought one of those to the Antique Road Show, <laughs> I'd ask you, are, are you a wealthy man, sir? <laughs> The whole set. <laughs> yeah, well, then you had the whole set. I presume this is oil on Kansas. Yeah, oil, oil on. On plywood. On plywood. On plywood. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not about to say canvas. I, you think it's panel? Panel. Uh, or paintings. Well, all right, let's, I, I'll say panels until some of you uh, Google it. <laughs> yes. Is there another verse to tell us what happened to the daughter? Uh, the, 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 the daughter who gets a, she marries this uh, this old guy. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, in the in the fairy tales, the way it works out is there are the three sons, and the, the youngest son who really doesn't have a chance of slaying the dragon slays the dragon and wins the the, the hand of the princess and and marries in, into royalty, and that's. That's the fairy tale version, which is a providential in, in, a, in a kind of un, unreligious sense, but a, you know a Disney sense. Uh, th that's that's the way it would work out. Uh, one of the things that your comment pointed out is that the girl isn't much a party to this bargain. She, she's booty. I mean, essentially, she's commodified. You know, if you do something good for me, you can have the hand of my daughter. I don't care what kind of a, a rotten person you are. You saved my rear end, and you've got the yeah, outline of my daughter. It is all canvas. It's canvas. Is it really? There it is. Canvas. So you looked up the National Gallery set? No, Wikipedia. Okay. I mean, you're right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do, uh, do you know if Eastern cultures have a similar history of sails of the, of the sea? And say it again. Eastern cultures. Um, do they have the similar history? Uh, well, voyage is one of the earliest and most enduring metaphors uh, of, of life. Because it, I mean, it just, it just uh, the pilgrim's progress. The whole idea that, of that there is a beginning and a middle and an end of life. Life is linear. At least the temporal life is linear. And there are and then maybe we can uh, superimpose on that. Life has phases, like like childhood, youth, and adulthood, and, and old age. And then perhaps I'll think of it in terms of the sea. The sea is, I mean, if you can sail a ship, uh, your, your culture is, is made for you. Uh, read, read Homer's Odyssey, and there, there, there are these people are really famous because they have mastered the sea. And the sea is really dangerous, it's out there. You and I can walk across that street, but we really can't walk across the sea. We can get in a boat, and you better stay close to land, because that's about the only way I can tell where we are, by looking at the traffic lights and following along. Uh, once you get out past, uh, past the, the, the landmarks, then God knows, I mean, here be dragons. Uh, that's, that's, what all, that's what all the, uh, the medieval maps showed us. That's where all the nasties hung out on the other side of the sea, and they and like Scylla and Charybdis, they could reach out and grab. <coughs> I, 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 and yes, Gilgamesh. Gil, ah, right, Gilgamesh, right. And so it's 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 enduring, and and the sea because it requires one, it requires technology that you can actually build something that floats, and then that you can control the direction of the float somehow, uh, and then you can do it deliberately. And uh, and you can come back and you can have uh, that's how adventures. If you go, don't come back. You can't have adventures because <laughs> nobody <laughs> will know. <laughs> yes.
agree uh, disagree with everyone. I don't think the cabin boy was the hero because a hero would have jumped in and done the good deed. I think he's a little blackmailer. And essentially, that's the conversation that that we have in talking about it. One of the things I can do with my children when I want to say, now listen, you know what you can do? Don't do what the little boy did. It's much better. On the other hand, maybe I'm, I'm more interested in, in establishing a kind of a work ethic and good work gets rewarded. And, and uh, good work isn't its own reward. But uh, I mean, that's, it's just what you call this a value judgment. And, there, and that's, that's exactly where, where that where that ballad, I think, leads. The ballads are not pretty. A lot of those ballads end in death, mayhem, destruction. There's betrayal of marriage vows. Uh, th there's, there's murder. There's, there all sorts of terrible things happen. The kinds of things we love to read about and watch in movies now that, that are rated. And you can see it in slow, happen in slow motion. The, the, the ballads are essentially like Gritty. It's a, it's a kind of thing I, I guess we love about old country music too, uh, and and about about early rock, the the angst that uh, teenagers would have about uh, driving their car off a cliff and losing the dog. Once again, we've lost a girl, a teen angel. <laughs> they, they, the, the notion of that the fragility of life, and what we can talk about. Other comments or questions? And I, I like that, by the way. That's. <clears throat> And, and of course, it takes guts to go against the entire room and treat for this little boy. And, and we'll, we will report you to child protective <laughs> But but the truth is, don't be tricked by appearance and the easy judgment. The easy and obvious judgment may be the wrong one. Yes. I don't know why this caught my eye, but in the third cold painting. Guy is that one? Uh, well, so, all right, just leave it right there. He's facing like this. He's brightly lit. This, the bow of the boat is brightly lit, and the sun is behind him. Is that so? Am I nitpicking, or is that something allegorical? Next question, please. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well I, I mean, of course, if you're an artist. Uh, Poetic justice and there's artistic uh, uh, license as well. Uh, the 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 idea of that's not exactly a sun, but it is the source of light, and it's the light that we're going to be headed to, at, in the in the in the last panel as well when we're going in that direction. The, off the light uh, that's what it is. It's reflected off the light. But it's, it's this is three point lighting, and we uh, we what we have in this in this in this certainly. If if I showed you midnight, it would look a lot like the cloud picture. That it really, it, even if we turn off all the lights, it's difficult to see the figures in the clouds. But I, as an artist, I want to show you. Well, I want to show you his expression. I want to show you his gesture. I want to show you his posture, and I want to show you the details of the, the vessel and how it, much it's been ruined by experience, by by what is the real. Uh, and the only way I can do that is by shining a light on it. And uh, you're right, there's no, there's no sun in the water. But it's, it's like going to a theater and, uh, and having footlights, which so don't exist in real life. It's bringing attention to the sandglass, to the hourglass. And what? It's bringing attention to the hourglass. And it, it draws attention to the hourglass. And there is, it obviously is a source of light. He's got shadows going in that direction. And, and, you're, and you're right. So we, we got light from two directions. Well, I saw in the in the large overall picture the light on the rocks is also coming from the right. So yeah, I guess that's yeah. That's that's those of you who can see it. That's spiritual light. Those of you who can't, can't see it, there's an angel up there. Say, that's yeah, right. Oh, she, he's only interested in the material light. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the background between the uh, I guess clouds that almost look like waves. Uh, you see, a, I see something that appears like a house. Oh, like a house or a ship? Is there a significance to that? Uh, well, he drew he drew crazy rocks, and uh, and uh, I mean these these are 
Allegorical yeah, the, the, the allegorical <laughs> rocks. Yeah, the You can be thrown. Allegorical rocks can hit you in the, in the face. He's, he's, um, what, and he's interested in nature, and he is actually he's a landscape painter, and he's not a very good figure painter, uh, as you could probably tell. But he's he's he's, he's an earnest figure painter, and he really does draw these rocks. It's not exactly nature. He follows nature as far as it goes, but it doesn't go as far as he wants to. It spits in his eye and makes his rocks come out and look really rather, well, they're, they're imposing and they make us all uneasy. And both in the foreground and, and that, that background thing that almost looks like a ship too. It's, uh, yeah, that's right. It's, it's, so in the, in the background, uh, I can't tell you exactly what it is. This isn't what the Hudson River looks like exactly. No. <laughs> but it takes elements of the Hudson River. It takes elements of, there are things growing there that don't grow in any place in the world at one time. He's put them all together. Oh, and if, if you go down, down Holcomb, the flower market, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find flowers that don't grow in Houston this time of year. Uh, <laughs> you can buy them though, yes. I'm curious, your your granddaughter. I assume you sung the ballad to her. What, what was what what was her first reaction? Uh, well, actually, my granddaughters are a lot kinder to me than my children. My children used to say, "Put that guitar away." <laughs> my grandchildren think it's wonderful, everything, and the reason is I only see them once a year. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm a star when I when I go. There. So, they, and, that's the whole, the whole idea. When it, my students really love it. <coughs> when I bring the guitar, one, it means that I'm not going to be lecturing and they won't be responsible for it. <laughs> uh, and the other is, uh, you know, I'm an English teacher uh, and uh, not, not a musician. and uh, So I never disappoint my audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs>